I mean, good morning, everyone. <laughs> Hello, Chris. Uh, thanks very much to everyone who spoke yesterday for what's been the most outstanding PyCon AU ever. It's just been amazing. So thanks for giving all your time as well. So my talk is somewhat lazily named Sharing Stuff with Python, so I'm not going to dwell on the name. My name, Tennessee Lewenberg. I work for the Centre for Australian Weather and Climate Research, which is part of the Australian Bureau of Meteorology in partnership with CSIRO. I've been working in Python for about 10 years. Uh, before that, I was working in Java, and before that, I was just at uni. And my work involves mostly automatic text generation, artificial intelligence, and weather domain logic. So the system that I work on is responsible for producing the first draft of all of the text weather forecasts that you see uh, on, the, on the web page and over the TV and so forth, uh, along with, obviously, a team of many. I have a philosophy diploma. I can't really remember why I did that, but I enjoyed it a lot. And then I went and did a Masters of Business Administration. I can remember why I did that, and I didn't enjoy it as much. <laughs> I uh, completed a couple of uh, Udacity online courses, the so-called MOOCs in Artificial Intelligence and Robotic Vehicle Control. And for the past four years, I've been relegated to the bench as a manager. So this talk, super high level. It's aimed at developers. I think I got that right. OK, so people without a tech background are often not fully aware of what it takes to get things done and what the hidden costs are, and also are often too busy to really think about it, even if they do have some awareness. This lack of awareness can be a major disconnect between, between people in general, but specifically to us, between developers and managers, domain experts, and others involved in modern cross-functional teams. Also, sharing's important. According to a recent Cambridge study, says this press report, the global cost of debugging software has to three, risen to $312 billion annually. So one, I think that's probably about right. But two, I just have to share here some of the details and why you need to spend some time understanding things that are being put in front of you in general. This goes for us as developers and managers as well. One, it's a big number. It's about five times the market value of Facebook is just spent debugging software. Another one, the only real reference I could find to this is through something called PRweb.com. Now, this is, in fact, a legitimate study and a legitimate link, but the journalists involved didn't care to source the uh, reference where they got the original study from. Don't do this. You need to be more transparent with what it is that you're putting in front of people if you really want to gain their credibility. So let's talk about credibility. This is a frequent problem. Both of these things are peacocks, or so I'm led to understand. The one on the left is the one that they asked me to build. And the one on the right is the one that's as simple as possible. This is the one that I will build 10 times out of 10 unless I understand that this is what is required. So how do we get there? Well, we're going to take a little side journey before I get to the point. We're going to talk about evolution instead, or everything has a history, and the fact that zebras are not donkeys. Zebras look a bit like donkeys. They both have long faces. This one has stripes, but it's just the chrome, right? Who really cares? <laughs> but the, the point is, is that no matter how similarly similar these things are, I can ride a donkey. That's probably the key feature here. You can actually ride a donkey. But there is really no practical way to get from a zebra to a donkey, despite the obvious similarities. I know this because, well, I actually haven't tried, but like I'm pretty sure, OK? I think you can trust me. OK. But, and, and that's, that, but when I'm telling that to my manager, like, no, no, you, you just can't get there from here, it's not always such an obvious conversation. So let's talk about what's going on. I don't know anything about biology, and I'm a lazy researcher, so you're really going to just have to like, just follow the hand-waving on this one. The genotype refers to the things that make up the donkey on the inside. It's history, it's ancestry, it's genes, the reasons why it's a donkey. It's phenotype, well, as you saw, its phenotype is kind of like, you know, brown, and it's like it's a pretty cute donkey, and it's got floppy ears, and, and so forth. So when people see two things with a similar phenotype, 
it's pretty logical to kind of support your first guess is that probably they have a similar genotype. Turns out that's not true. So this is my back of, uh, it's not quite a napkin, this is my very elegant sketch that I put together to generally explain my understanding of how evol evolution works. Is that this is a love story between Fido and Lassie. Fido has brown spots, he's very big, and his key feature is that he's a very warm, loving, and happy individual. That's his phenotype. Lassie up the top there, she's you know, very impressive. She, she's intelligent, uh, at, by, by happenstance, medium size, and, and, and golden, golden fur. At least that's what I remember from watching Lassie. But the key feature up there is, is that she's very intelligent. And these, these phenotypes, phenotypic advantages in the real world, give, uh, have brought them together. And so like, like any two people that are in love, they, they come together and, and they start a family. And what we can see here is that as we follow it through the generations, these phenotypes persist. Again, perhaps I don't have to draw the dots for you when building software. The major advantages in software persist. And what we end up after a number of generations is something called a wild type. There are many things that are Fido-like in the world, many, many offspring of Fido in future generations, but they all carry this phenotype through into their later stages of evolution. So someone who actually knows what they're doing drew this picture. And what I can see here is that quite a lot of these things, the, these animals here on the phenotype side, some of them look pretty different, some of them look pretty similar, and some of the ones that look pretty similar are pretty far away on these lines here. And in a sense, these lines going through here represent work for some, in some sense, undertaken by evolution over, over the number of years to result in this diversity of different species that we see here on the right. But getting back from one to the other is not so easy. In a breeding program, perhaps you could get from the Arctic fox to the kit fox with relatively little work. If the kit fox had some advantage, the Ar Arctic fox had less of, you could probably, you know, make your way from one to another. But there's probably really no way to make your way fr from the top to the bottom. Uh, it may be possible to, tr to move from a CGI bin application written with a whole lot of scripts to a Django app, but it may not be as easy to uh, translate your core business logic from Java to Python. So planning and decisions is where I feel this comes in. There's this myth that if you could just work out what you actually wanted early enough, early, you wouldn't have to get from the top to the bottom. You just turn left instead of, instead of turning right. It's free if you can make the decision back there. But there's not really any such thing as back there, really. We basically choose something. Everything has a history. There's nothing that doesn't have a history. There's no clean starting point. There is no clean slate. There's just complexity that we bring in. So at the start, when we appear to have a clean slate, what we don't have is visibility. We don't have visibility of the complexity we're bringing in. We don't have the visibility of the complexity that's leading where we're going. And the only person who's sitting there making these decisions is you, as a developer. And I don't know about you, but when it's me, that's a pretty dodgy heuristic for an A-star search. So, yet another complete change of direction. People who rise to leadership roles have been prepared to be different. Don't believe everything you think, aka don't get stuck in a rut. So here I'm going to talk about the personal side of being involved in decisions and communication and people's reactions. Now I'm not trying to address here people who may be facing situations of gross poor behaviour or, or serious dis dysfunction, I'm just talking about the Per, the, the sufficiently complex ordinary interactions that when we, f we face when we go to work with four or five other people who are all basically going to work to get on, with, get on with their job and the complexities that arise therein. So this is me cooking some pancakes and this, this expresses to me one, a number of things, is that I love how ambiguous it is, is that I'm basically a happy guy, I turn up to work and I try and get things done. Now, as a manager, I'm pretty aware of some things. One is, is that comp software is more complex than a pancake. Another one is that people aren't spatulas. And, ano 
And another one is that, is that I'm not actually allowed to wear silly hats in the workplace. It, it somehow doesn't seem to set the right tone. But that aside, broadly, people expect me to bring the whole meal together. I turn up to work and my role as, as a manager is that people are looking me to bring it together and that's pretty much the same as a chef. But then I get this sneaking suspicion that what I'm doing isn't actually quite the right thing. And I've had this as a manager and I've had this as a developer and I've seen it in others. Sometimes you really begin to question <laughs> whether you're supposed to be doing what it is that you're actually doing. Sometimes you'll walk into a room full of managers as a developer and they're not going to listen to you. They're going to say, what do you mean it's too difficult? What do you mean it's too hard? Why can't it get done faster? And you're left going, but I've given you the reasons. Sometimes you'll be in a group of people and the person you're working with just doesn't seem to get it. Now this usually isn't because there's anything inherently wrong wrong, sorry, wrong with the person in this picture. Normally it's about roles. There's going to be a reason. There's always some reason and there's an immediate frustration but if you think hard and long enough and you can take a deep breath and get there, there's normally some reason. Maybe they're, in, maybe they're new to the role. Maybe their experience is in something very different and, and they're coming together with it. Maybe they're just busy. And then sometimes this is just how you feel about other people. You know the sad thing is that science says it's true. I'm actually not very good at any of these things. This is the most amazing study I've ever read. This is called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And for anyone who thinks they're any good at anything, you should read this cover to cover four times. What this is saying is that people who are terrible, like abjectly horrible at performing on some task, think that they're like pretty good, pretty good. So if you're cruising around and you've just, you know, you've had a tough time of whatever it is that's in front of you and you think, you know what, I've got it. I feel like 60, 70% confident. I'm just getting started. Well, I'm sorry, we haven't. <laughs> okay, so people who are doing a little bit worse, still 60, 70%, they're feeling pretty good, pretty good. So the top two lines up there represent, for someone who's really terrible, they feel pretty good before they do the test, they also feel pretty good after they do the test, and then their marks don't pan out. Okay, third quartile, people with actual competence. There's this odd dip. That's pretty weird to me. So what's happening here is that the people who actually have some degree of competence in what they're talking about generally mark themselves about as well as the people who are as bad as they can possibly be and slightly worse than the people who are only quite bad at it. And only the very, very best people at performing a particular task actually see a lift in their actual performance. So there's a, there's a number of reasons uh, of things going, here, going on here, but the one that, that, having read the paper, I believe is the most particularly relevant is that in order to assess competence, you have to have competence. Now, I don't mean like have the right stuff in the sense of like intelligence or just being a good human. I mean for the particular problem at hand. You know, I'm, I'm a very, very bad soccer player. I, after many years, I've finally accepted I'm a very, very bad soccer player. It took a little time, okay? But I didn't know it for years because I couldn't tell. I can watch a game of soccer with people who are bad and people who are good and I go, they're playing soccer. So it, in order to develop a real understanding of whether, you've, whether you have a good plan, whether you're going in the right direction, why something is the way it is, you need to look at developing your own competence before you can really make that assessment. I'm now going to take five minutes out to watch a movie. This is also, this is what I call the antidote. The antidote to the frustration, the antidote to our own frustrated sense of incompetence or our own actual and justified sense of incompetence at some place. Because when, when you turn up to work, it doesn't matter if you're not good at the thing yet. That's okay, you're allowed to not be good at everything. It's pretty expected, but this is the antidote. This is how we can get, 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 
get in the direction of progress. So it's, a, it's five minutes, it's a bit long for it, take time out of a keynote, but it's one of the most interesting things that I've ever seen. And thanks to this group, RSA Animate, for the animation. I didn't prepare this content, obviously. Our motivations are unbelievably interesting. I mean, it, I, I find, I've been working on this for a few years, and I just find the topic still so amazingly engaging and, and interesting. So I want to tell you about that. The science is really surprising. The science is a little bit freaky, OK? It, we are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. There's a whole set of unbelievably interesting studies. I want to give you two that call into question this idea that if you reward something, you get more of the behavior you want. If you punish something, you get less of it. So let's talk, let's go from London to the mean streets of Cambridge, Massachusetts, in the northeastern part of the United States. And let's talk about a study done at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Here's what they did. They took a whole group of students, and they gave them a set of challenges. Things like um, memorizing strings of digits, uh, solving word puzzles, other kinds of spatial puzzles, even physical tasks like throwing a ball through a hoop. Okay, they gave them these challenges, and they said to incentivize their performance, they gave them three levels of rewards. Okay? So if you did pretty well, you got a small monetary reward. If you did medium well, you got a medium monetary reward. And if you did really well, if you were one of the top performers, you got a large cash prize. Okay? We've seen this movie before. This is essentially a typical motivation scheme within organizations. Right? We reward the very top performers. We ignore the low performers and the other folks kind of in the middle. OK, you get a little bit. So what happens? They do the test. They have these incentives. Here's what they found out. One, as long as the task involved only mechanical skill, bonuses worked as they would be expected. The higher the pay, the better the performance. OK, that makes sense. But here's what happens. But once the task called for even rudimentary cognitive skill, a larger reward led to poorer performance. Now, this is strange, right? A larger reward led to poorer performance? How can that possibly be? Now, what's interesting about this is that these folks here who, who, who did this are all economists, at, at, two at MIT, one at the University of Chicago, one at Carnegie Mellon, okay? The top tier of the economics profession. And they're reaching this conclusion that seems contrary to what a lot of us learned in economics, which is, which is that the higher the reward, the better the performance. And they're saying, that once you get above rudimentary cognitive skill, it's the other way around. Which seems like this kind of, the idea that these rewards don't work that way seems vaguely left-wing and socialist, doesn't it? It's kind of <laughs> this kind of weird socialist conspiracy. <clears throat> For those of you who have those conspiracy theories, I want to point out the, so, the notoriously left-wing socialist group that financed the research, the Federal Reserve Bank. So this is the mainstream of the mainstream coming to a conclusion that's quite Surprising. Seems to defy the laws of behavioral physics. So this is strange. It's strange funny. So what do they do? They say, Let's, this, is, this is freaky. Let's go test it somewhere else. Maybe that $50 or $60 prize isn't sufficiently motivating for an MIT student, right? So let's go to a place where $50 is actually more significant relatively. Right? So with, let's take the experiment. We're going to go to Madurai, India, rural India, where $50, $60, whatever the number was, is actually a significant sum of money. So they replicated the experiment in India roughly as follows. Small rewards, the equivalent of two weeks' salary. Um, I mean, sorry, small performance, low performance, two weeks' salary. Medium performance, about a month's salary. Um, high performance, about two months' salary. Okay, so those are real good incentives. Okay, so you're going to get a different result here. Well, what happened, though, was that the people offered the medium reward did no better than the people offered the small reward. But this time around, the people offered the top reward, they did worst of all. Higher incentives led to worse performance. What's interesting about this is that it actually isn't all that anomalous. This has been replicated over and over and over again by psychologists, by um, some extent by sociologists, uh, and by economists. Over and over and over again. For simple, straightforward tasks, those kinds of incentives, if you do this, then you get that, they're great. For tasks that are algorithmic, set of rules where you have to just follow along and get a right answer, if then rewards, carrots and sticks, outstanding. But when the task gets more complicated, when it requires some conceptual creative thinking, those kinds of motivators demonstrably don't work. Fact, money is a motivator um, at work. 
but in a slightly strange way. If you don't pay people enough, they won't be motivated. What's curious about there's another paradox here, which is that the best use of money as a motivator is to pay people enough to take the issue of money off the table. Pay people enough so that they're not thinking about money and they're thinking about the work. Now, once you do that, it turns out there are three factors that the science shows lead to the better performance. Um, not to mention personal satisfaction. Autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy. So autonomy, mastery, and purpose. So when we turn up at work, going back to that previous slide, we need to get to that level of competence. That's what we need for ourselves. That's what we need for the people around us. All of us are going to be uh, involved in work. We're thinking and problem solving is, is the major part of our day. Our bosses, our managers, the people we work with, no matter how frustrating or dense they appear to be at any moment in time, are also turning up to work in an environment where autonomy, autonomy mastery and purpose is what's driving them at work. It's not money. Money can represent status. Status can be a source of conflict. Supervision, supervisory control, those issues can be a source of, con of conflict. But simply money isn't a big issue. So how, how do we design teams? How do we take this back to the world of open source? How do we take this back to work? How do we take it back to ourselves? How do we take it back to the way we share with others? How do we give other people who are working with us the control that they need to do their job when their job is managing us? How do they give us the control we need to do our job when we are working for them? How do we work with our customers to give them the control that they need when we are working to supply their needs? And Steve, no, Henry Ford once said, if I'd listened to my customers, I would have well built the world's best horse-drawn carriage. Okay, so we need to do more. We need to say no. We need to be able to have our own control and we need to give them some control. So how do, we, how do we get towards that direction? Now, I want to talk about this in the context of a real situation, something much more concrete, something much more relevant. Say you've got four people, and we have a problem to solve. We have to build something. We need to build a Django app. It needs to, um, you know, obviously, well, we don't need to build a Django app. There's no such thing. We need to build a web app. Someone who knows about web apps and uses Python it has a preference for a Django app, and we have someone from the customer side, and we have a meeting once a fortnight with them because we're all agile, which is fantastic, by the way. So I want to talk about here about how my thinking works as a developer, how I think generally thinking works when addressing problems, which is this cycle here, which is that we start, we're confronted with a problem. All of you, to some degree, depending on exactly how good a night you had last night, are thinking about this situation. Information's interesting. Who are these four people? I want to know more. What's their problem? A web app, that's not a good description of a problem. Are they selling shoes or are they selling software? They're different. You want to know more. You care about where this story is going. But then after a while, it's just somebody talking at you. You've learned it. You're like, yeah, right, look, I get it. I just want to do something now. I want to, I want to build my concrete system here. I've, I've learned a lot of information. I've done a lot of reading. I've consulted with people. I've understood what I'm pretty sure I've got to build. So now, okay, I've got this picture in my head. I'm going to go away. It's going to take me, I've got to provision some machines. I'm going to use a, a vagrant and salt to provision them all because that seems really good because I learned that recently. And I'm going to sit there and, and give give demos once a fortnight because I've heard demos are good and we'll have a scrum board. Okay, we're doing it and we know what we're going to build. So we get on with it. Now, if you're at this stage and somebody comes in with some new information, oh, hey, by the way, I've learned something new. That's, that's really annoying. Back here, back here, that information was cool. Here, this information is not cool because we're building it. And then, then, it, then it's there and then we, we kind of take a brief, deep breath. We, we, we move on. There's a process in place. So now what we're doing is we can see that change is needed. Like we've built it, we got it done, but we can see their point. Something, something's not right there. But if somebody's still back here, okay, if someone still feels like this isn't done, like it hasn't made it to operations, it's not, not finished, it's not reliable enough, then this is death march territory. You know, you've just got to keep grinding away on something where you're still, you want to move on. Okay, so here we're accepting. You know, we're like, okay, I built that thing, it was good, there are new needs, I'm happy about that. Adapt, inspect, have a look. Come back towards the information. Information is interesting again. So 
Over time, groups of people who are working together will go through these stages in a similar and coordinated fashion. If you don't engage with the people around you, your manager, your colleagues, your supervisor, the juniors, uh, customers, clients, the full spectrum of stakeholders, you're not going to have synchronisation around here. Now, that might be okay at stage one, where you can cover off the ground. Everything can be explained relatively easily. But what, when you're, what if you're going up on version two of this iteration? Suddenly things become more complex. If someone try, if, even if you're in the same stage, information is interesting, you might be up at stage four. If you're a Django core developer and you're confronted with a problem, you're, you're thinking at a different level to someone who's coming in at the, you know, at the bottom. There's nothing wrong with the fact that you're at different levels, but there's another source of uncoordination, a disconnect there between the people that you're trying to work with and, and where you're trying to get to. And so what we want to not talk about is what are the disconnects which lead to this kind of situation? We talked about the motivation disconnect, looking at autonomy, mastery and purpose. You want to know where you're going. You want someone who's representing a goal state to you, telling you that yes, this is valuable. You do this with your time and we are going to get there. You also want to be able to work on your own as a developer. And you also want to have the control that you need to get your job done. We've talked about the delusion of competence. Any time that you think that you know, you're in the right and everyone else is in the wrong, actually, yes, that is sometimes true, but it's a dangerous path to go down and get too anchored in. We've talked about management disconnect to a degree. I wanted to just drill into that a little more and talk about two kinds of managers that tend to come around. There's technical managers in the world, people like me. I used to be a developer. I still write the odd line of code, and, and now I'm kind of, to a degree, moving on slightly into product owner roles or pure management and I fill out a lot of forms and I justify things and, and I try to keep that sort of helicopter perspective. The frustrations there are that sometimes you, it's not clear when you're a technical manager, it's, it's less obvious where it is that you're supposed to go. You have to do a bit more work to figure out what the right direction is and that can frustrate other people because it's not as obvious that you're leading them in a good direction. It's not as obvious that things are kind of all right. On the other hand, when they say they need to spend a week doing the unit testing and refactoring something because of some reason, you get it and it's fine. So that can be very positive. Another kind of manager is the domain expert manager. And I'd like to think that most managers have some kind of background in something. I'm not really going to try and dwell on people who just don't have a background. But domain experts, they probably just think that you know, if they say they'd like something, that you'll just kind of fairly happily go off and build it. That there won't really be, be much more to it than that. Yeah, can I please have a shopping cart application? You do, you do web development, you, just, you, you know all about them, right? You know what I want already, because you're a web developer, that's just what you're for. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, that's pretty much what I expect when I take my car to the mechanic. I drive it in and I say, it is broken fix it. And then they come back to me and they say, I have fixed it. There was something wrong with something near the sump and the, the brake pads needed to be realigned because they had somehow gotten out of balance. Okay, I don't, I don't get it, but I do in fact expect him to get it. I expect him to know what I need. So why is it really so terribly unreasonable that the people around us expect us to know what they need? Now, the answer is, that we actually both need to get up that ladder, get up that knowledge ladder, get up that, that information ladder. Reduce the disconnect, because we're going to be building something as a team. It's okay when you're not on the same team, but we're gonna do this as a team. Open source is everything's a team, really, but e even in a workplace, your organizational structure may put you all in the same room. You might have to do some of this work for yourself. You might have to go, well, I'm on team e A, they're on team B, I can see we're going to need to actually get to know each other here. So the productivity of teams is to a degree where I see the way out of this. Diversity as a solution to local minima is where I see the way out of this. Working with someone else, 
they're not going to do your work for you. They're not going to come in and say, oh, no, look, I've read all about Django and I've read all about Ruby on Rails and I've actually understood your technical domain and you need to make this technical decision. That, that's not going to happen, right? Because even if they had three weeks to go and learn one, learn the other and come to that decision, it's not what they're best placed to do. It's not a proper use of their expertise. The proper use of their expertise is to come to the margins, it's to come to the interface with you also at the interface so that they can teach you what you need to know and you can teach them what they need to know. It's about a development of trust between the people on your team and learning how to act in a way where you perform effectively as a group, where you all get on the idea elevator together so that you're at the same level and at the same point in the cycle to the extent possible together. That means a quality of information. That means not hiding your test coverage or the fact that you just, you know, you had a lazy week at work and you built a game on a wiki. It means actually, you <laughs> it means, but it also means not yelling at people when they do that. It means that we're all people and we act professionally, but give or take a brick, there's gonna be a bit of play in the system. It also doesn't mean giving up individual productivity. It doesn't mean that dividing up thinking is you do that, you do that, you do that, you do that, and in a year's time we'll be done. No, it doesn't mean that, you've got to share, but it doesn't mean that it's not okay to just work by yourself for three days to work through a problem, or a week. And it doesn't mean that it's not okay for someone to be a lead architect who sees the whole system. In fact, that's a very useful thing. It doesn't mean that you can interrupt someone every 10 minutes. That's not very useful either. You have to respect individual productivity because just as everything that I've said about group dynamics is true, it is also absolutely true that people can be highly productive and usually are in it when they're uninterrupted for a reasonable bite of time. So section three, Python is doing it right in many examples. So this is the bit where we just chill out, I'll show you some tools, it's all pretty cruisy from here, folks. So transparency of information at all costs. In order to get yourself your autonomy and your control, you need to gain credibility. You need to show people that what you're doing is sensible, reliable. It's not gonna be predictable, but people will accept that if you show them what you are doing with your time and what your actual productivity is. Just because you're not achieving what they want at their expected pace doesn't mean that they won't accept what you give them in terms of information about your actual productivity. So let's talk about a couple of systems here that demonstrate some of what I'm talking about. This one's not a Python example. This is a website called Forecast.io, which is really cool for all the weather nerds in the audience. Maybe it's just me. Um, so here we have a basic system. It's very accessible. The information's all at the front. But I can go back to this thing here called the time machine. I can go back in time and I can see what the forecast was in the past. So I can check whether what they said in the past matched up with what actually happened. I can go, these people here who are running this system, I don't know who they are, they are I don't know what their data is from, I don't necessarily trust them yet. And I care, so, you, know, you know, obviously, look, forecasts are forecasts, it's fine, this will be right data. But if I actually, you know, maybe it's a critical use case for me, I can go back to December 26th, 2010 and see what their forecast said. They are being open, they are being transparent and therefore I trust them. PyPy is also doing it right. This is Python. PyPy is the Python interpreter written in Python. So what these people have is something called a system called code speed. And what we see here on the, on the yellow line there that we just scrolled past, that's normalized to C Python performance. All of these graphs here are individual pi pi relative performances. We can see here check-in by check-in what the impact of the modification that occurred was. We can go back to the timeline. We can see for a specific set of benchmarks what the performance has been over time. Even if, somewhat, even if the pi pi developers wander off into the forest and don't do anything very visible for three months that I care about, I can see that they're busy. I can see that they're doing things. I can see that they're taking responsibility when an issue occurs. I can see that these people 
you know, they've got it together, right? And that's what we need to build. We need to build this image in our supervisors, in our customers, in our clients, that we, as a group, we have got it together. We are doing the things. So I'm going to go through here to some of the tools we can use as ourselves to do this. I mean, actually, this code speed tool, that's a downloadable thing. You can pull it off GitHub. You can build one. I highly recommend it. I'm going to go through here one specific example of where I used a piece of technology called the IPython notebook, which we saw talked about yesterday. And I think that these things are going to be with us uh, for a very, very long time. And this is also where I'm going to dive into live demo territory. But it's not that live, so I wouldn't worry about it. So what I've done here is I've uh, pulled out uh, some things, some notebooks from the internet and one of my own making into, into this directory. And I'm going to just spool up a notebook here. OK, here we go. So I've got a couple of notebooks. This one here, a notebook is basically like a cross between like an interpreter and a wiki. So back in, back in some time in the past, oh, look, we can see my stand-up time, fellas. You've got to make the daily stand-up. OK, so here we go. This is a, a notebook that's uh, helping us understand Bayesian logic. Now, I'm not here to advocate that everyone needs to go and learn Bayesian logic. What I'm saying is that this is a really good way to do so, should that be of, of interest to you at this particular point in time. So we can go through here. Uh, it looks like a book. It's telling me stuff. It's telling me st more stuff. It's telling me about the state of mind I'm supposed to have. Yeah, yeah, go on, go on, go on. I just want to write the code. Oh, there's some maths. Oh, wait, I don't understand maths. Oh, code. OK, so the advantage of, something, of a system like this, now I've extracted this code out into another notebook, is that you can copy and paste the code out into another notebook for your own purposes, on your own system. You can execute it live. I don't have to trust that this thing, when this got published, happened to work at the time. I can go up here and push go. And it sits there, and it grinds away, and it gives me error messages, so I know it's real. And here we go. Here's the output. So I'm like, oh, OK. Now, I'll just spend a brief time. So this is, this is just going through, tossing some coins. Tossed a coin. Oh, it didn't, cost, no, it didn't toss any coins, flat distribution. Oh, wait, it tossed one, and the only one it got was a head, so it's, it's biased. And then we toss a few more coins, and OK, that's still a bit out of whack. Oh, here we go. It's a bit of a lump, but it's kind of biased. We've got you know, not enough heads you know, for, what's bi for what's reasonable. Maybe the number generators on the fritz, I don't know. Oh, wait, hang on. So if we toss enough coins where I'm headed, OK, bang. OK, now we can see that this distribution is centered on, on 0.5. So I can go in here and validate for myself that what's happening is real. Now, not terribly many managers are always going to want to go into every dimension of what it is that we want to do. But if we need to spin up a tool to explain some, something to someone, we can use a tool like this. Now, I'm not trying to say that the manager in this example is going to spend some time commenting on our code. They may, but basically that's our job. It's our job as a team of developers, and it's uh, architecture leads, and it's, it's technology people's job. But this is a way where we can literally change the code on the fly for an example and have the person in the room commenting on what these things are supposed to look like. It's a way of bridging that disconnect, of reducing the distance, but not, try, but not crossing over. So, Without a system like this, the distance between what we've been asked to build by our manager, our boss, the person who doesn't get it, doesn't put the time into thinking why our problems are hard, and us, who are spending a lot of time you know, struggling to build this thing as fast as, as their appetite goes for, gets narrower. We can come together at least on this particular point. And so I did this. I did this at work, and I gave it a go. And some people at work were telling me a lot of things about sea breezes. Our code spurs out a lot of, lot of guff. This is an upside down Tasmania, by chance, and it, didn't really, it wasn't terribly relevant to turn it the right way around for my example. I figured they could cope with it. So more, more downloading, more, more, more code. OK, so now this is, this is an action. So this is a graph of the height of the ocean with respect to the distance from the coastline. And this is so that I can say things like, seas one to two meters, increasing to four meters offshore. Pretty straightforward. 
And people were telling me that this, were giving me all these examples where this was going to really, really easily be the case. Now, let's see if I can just shrink this down a bit. Yeah, here we go. Okay. Okay, so that looks all right on the projector. So, whoo, whoops, there we go. Maybe even one more shrink. So people were telling me that this particular day, this represents three hour blocks of the day with the morning in the top left and the evening in the top right, was a really good candidate for sea breezes one to two meters increasing to three meters offshore. And I think maybe it was lower offshore. It was, there was supposed to be a differentiation. But what we can see is that the evening's actually pretty flat. This line here represents like what would be explained by the language. This is like the claim. Is, is that blue line, and all of these points are the actual data points that are supposed to relate to that claim. If the claim was true, you would see the blue line exactly kind of matching all of these points. But what we see here is that particularly in the middle of the day, but kind of all over the shop, there is in fact not really very much relationship between those blue dots and that blue line. Now, if I didn't have this piece of evidence available to have that conversation with these people, there is no way that they would accept my word as a technology developer over their word as a scientist, because, it's beca because it becomes competitive. You don't want it to become competitive. But they love looking at pictures, because this is their bread and butter. These pictures are their bread and butter. They're like, oh, right, now I care. Now I'm interested. Now I see that actually what's going on in this particular data set isn't what I thought was going on in this data set. Okay, try a different data set, or try a different algorithm, or try a different way of processing something. And all of a sudden, they're in their technical element. They're in what they do for a day job. They're, they're in their domain of competence. They're somewhere that I can't go. But we've managed to bridge the disconnect. Oh, how do I restart the presentation in two seconds flat? Oh, from the beginning, of course, That's because that's really where I wanted to be. Okay. All right. So, five second overview. Okay, so here's, here's some more example, examples. This is something called a sea breeze. The sea breeze here has been to a degree manually inserted and, and that you can see an increase very close to the coastline in this particular example. The broad scale wind field is just doing, you know, whatever it does. But in this, in this fine scale here, the, the, the land and the ocean are interacting. The heat, the heat transfer at the land and the ocean is interacting. And so they gave me some, some description of how to compare, how to produce numbers to compare what was going on on the land and the ocean. So I did that, and this is the graph I produced. And you can see very, very little difference between what's going on in the land and the ocean. Now, I don't know how to refine this algorithm particularly, it's not really my area of expertise. If somebody really sat me down and explained it, like I'm pretty sure I could follow it. I'm pretty sure all of you could follow it. No, none of this stuff is like actually ter you know, impossible to understand piece by piece. But knowing the whole space of the domain is, is really going to be beyond me. But again, this is somewhere where I can produce a, an image. I can make it tangible. I can make it concrete in order to have these conversations with people. So Python's doing it right. Python has these tools. SciPy, Matplotlib. Uh, you know, I'm not so strong on the, on the web side of things because I just don't like browser incompatibility and I don't go there. But I'm sure, that they, I'm sure it exists there too. So what is going on? What is going on in this example? How can we engage people in diving in? This is something I know about. This is a tree. I know all about trees. Republicans and Democrats are not quite the same thing as sea breezes, but the same principle applies. I can use my knowledge as a technologist in order to apply, apply techniques that I know how to solve to problems that people present to me. Each of these things here represents a kind of a decision point, inshore, offshore, above the ground, below the, you know, at the ground level wind direction and wind speed. Every one of these can be used as an indicator. I need to be knowledgeable about my, fi my domain, my field, so that I can apply the, what, the solutions that I know to somebody else. Where the hell is my slides going? Meeting of minds, so that we can have a meeting of minds. That's the goal, so that we can meet, so that we can bring those disconnects down to as, as narrow as possible. So, so pretty much I'm done. I'll, I'll say a few things to wrap up, and I thank you very much for your time. We've taken a look at 
evolution, how it applies to software, how decisions increment in software over time and how complexity builds, challenges in collaborating and tools and techniques, and converting this to outcomes. So in conclusion, I'd just say, as well as all of that, keep your sense of humour. <laughs>